to become who we want to be as individuals. And at the end of the day, that's going to help us be a successful offense. And the man, one on one coverage because the safety rolls to Jefferson's side. Jordan Love hit me up the night of the draft, you know, just congratulating me, letting me know it's time to work. Um, AJ Dillon was open arms. Von Rock caught a ball with his thighs. We didn't nah. talk about that. It was more of with his ass. If he throws a good ball, this is a running, catching touchdown, untied. Right. Like, if KP does like these flips after every win, and I'm like just waiting for him to do his flips. You know that we still love each other? That's what football brings us. Cross the safety's face. So you can tune in anywhere that you guys follow us on social media. Welcome to the Practice Squad Podcast. By the time this episode airs, we will be one week away from the 2024 NFL Draft. Um, I've officially Music to my ears, man. Oh, man, it's Music great. to I'm, my ears. I've hit the point where I'm doing now uh, like two to three mock drafts per day. You're an um, animal. John's a monster when it comes. You're a mock draft monster. Hey, hey, we're changing it up for this episode. So I'm sure everybody at this point is tired of hearing the same names going to the same places over and over again. So we're taking a slightly different approach for this episode and kind of Uno reversing it a bit. What players would be the most successful with X team is the question we're going to ask ourselves. So you're going to hear names to go to certain places that one, you're not hearing anywhere else really. And two, you know, aren't confined to our current draft order reality. It's just, where would these guys be the most successful? That's the question we're trying to answer. We're going to do there are, all three there are things. There are things that could happen. You know, crazier yeah. things have happened. How often does a draft go by the book? Almost never. No. I mean, the first few picks even can get shaken up really quickly. Trades can happen. You know, you might think a team might not take a quarterback, and they do. Like, crazier shit has happened. Let's not be fools and assume that, oh, everybody in their mock drafts has this happening, so that's what's going to happen. We have well, seen a, crazy things happen. A couple things with that, Mark. One, QB-heavy drafts like this one is, where a lot of teams are needy the trades are going to go insane and that's really going to shake up things up. And yes, we think Vikings might trade with, you know, so-and-so or Broncos are going to stay back or Raiders are going to stay back. You don't know that any of that for sure. Second thing is that a lot of these NFL teams, as we've seen just by, you know, last year's draft alone, draft boards look wildly different from team to team. For example, the Detroit Lions had Jameer Gibbs as their best player in the entire draft. At where do they pick to a twelve or wherever it was eight. after eight no. after they traded back? Yeah, no, it was twelve, I think, because Bijan went eight. Right. Yep, that's right. So, or or Jack Campbell, right? It's not you know Lions had an off ball linebacker way higher up on their draft board than most teams did. Mark's shaking his head. Both those guys ended up being successful, and so every team has a different philosophy which means that certain guys where you're like, how is this guy still on the board? You know, sometimes it just shakes out that way. And there's guys that, you know, are first round love us. to the second. Will Levis is a great example. Again, who's, you, you know, we don't know for sure if he's the guy in Tennessee, but like he's this, he's the guy this year and he's not, he didn't, you know, do a horrible job last season in the opportunities that he got. So we're going to try to go by division here. Let's see how good our, our divisional memory is. But starting with the NFC North, because we're going to start with the Chicago Bears. Mark, who are the best fits to join the Chicago Bears teams? Where would where would these guys thrive with the Bears for you? Interestingly enough, uh, it's not Caleb Williams. I mean, obviously, if they take Caleb Williams, I'm sure he'll do fine. I'm not saying that he's a guaranteed lock to be successful or a guaranteed bust, but I'm sick of hearing the Caleb Williams to Chicago thing. It's probably what's going to happen. But what I think are the two players that would be the safest, 100% going to be a good fit for them, no matter what happens at quarterback, what, no matter what happens with their coach situation, Malik neighbors, I think is an, is the best receiver in this draft. And I think he's a top three overall player in this draft. I do not think he's getting enough credit for how good he really is and how good he can be in the next level. Um, and on the offensive side of the ball, a receiver like that, I mean, I seriously think he's going to be comparable to like Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson, his LSU brothers. I really think he's going to be that good, that impactful in this league, and I think it's going to happen rather quickly no matter where he gets drafted. But in Chicago, what a great situation because he's going to have probably a good quarterback no matter who they take in the draft. Uh, it's going to be a guy who can sling the ball, and it's going to be a guy who can extend plays and get you the ball late. I think he'd thrive um, in an NFC North division too, with some coverage issues, if we're being honest. Yeah. Um, well, not to mention, I mean, there's a couple of people that are saying, what if the bears get aggressive and do what Houston did last year and go and get 
for certain like neighbors or a Dunze, like trade up nine to go to go grab one of those guys for Caleb Williams. It would be wild. I mean, here's the thing: you can probably sit and wait at nine and have a chance of getting Odunze uh, or Brian Thomas or somebody. But if you want, I'm telling you, neighbors is in a class of his own in this receiver position in this draft, and I I, I think he's by far and away the best at that position. If you want to go and be aggressive and do that, I mean, you're going to, it's a big swing, but I think it would pay off for him. And then on the defensive side of the ball, um, I like Wiggins. I mean, we talked about in our last episode, you need a corner that can just try to take a top receiver out of the game. You got to try to find someone who can follow Amon Ra. You got to try to find someone who can follow Jay Jettas, right? Um, you got to find someone who can, handle and take one of those Packers, those young receivers, one of those Packers out of the game completely and limit the number one option for the quarterbacks in this division. And it always is going to help. When you already have a good run defense, you got to get somebody who can take at least the top prospect, the top uh, receiver out of the game each week. So I go with a lockdown corner. Yeah. You know, they don't have the worst secondary in the world. So for defense, I actually went a slightly different route. I like Jared Verse. The thing with the Bears is while they have a really stout run defense, they actually had the lowest sack production in the league last year, if I remember correctly. And they took a step in the right direction uh, trading for Sweat, but putting somebody on the opposite side of them could be Jared Verse, right? And could, be a, pro- could be a problem. Could be a problem. And, I mean, you look at the division you're in, right? I mean, Green Bay, decent offensive line with a lot of receiving weapons. Lions, arguably offense, best offensive line in the league. Vikings are mid-tier, but as we're already talking about, like, you're, you're going to need a pass rush. And they're they're dealing with either Sam Darnold or a rookie quarterback, too. Like, the more, the more pressure you can generate, the better. So, you know, there's a possibility, hey, you know, Keenan Allen and uh, Moore and Mooney work for their receiver core this year, and they – decide to go edge rusher at nine two. That's 100% a possibility because they'll have their pick of whoever they want. Most likely, um, you know, barring maybe Atlanta going uh, Dallas Turner, or whoever in front of them. So, um, all right, moving on to let's go to the Vikings here. Mark, your quarterback prospect for the Vikings is not who everybody's mocking. And I'd love to hear your reason why. Yeah. Everybody's got JJ McCarthy, or Jaden Daniels, or somebody that they're moving up for. I actually really, really like the Minnesota Michael Penix Jr. Why do I like this? Michael Penix Jr. is is not getting talked about enough. We've we've covered this in many prior episodes. We've done individual episodes on him and why, with film evidence as to why we think this. But the biggest thing, they have a good receiving core and a great tight end in Minnesota already. You got Hawkinson, you got the best receiver in the league, you got a young up-and-coming Jordan Addison who's going to get favorable coverage matchups because of Jefferson and Hawkinson. And so what do you do to maximize that offensive attack? You get a quarterback who can make the neutral throws, the tough, tight window throws, the 50-50 vertical throws down the field better than anyone else in this draft. And really, it's not close, to be frank with you. It's Michael Penix Jr. Um his ability to, he's incredibly smart. You've heard him when he speaks in, in interviews and interviews and he's interviewed well with these teams, he breaks down coverage as well. And he's just a great thrower of the ball, putting the ball in spots where the receiver has a favorable chance of coming down with it, even when they're not very open. Right. And yes, Jefferson's going to get wide open often in Addison, but in those times where it's tight coverage because it's double or because you know that you're trying to throw it a lot, because it, let's be honest, the Vikings haven't had a great running game and, several years, right? They've won games because they sling it. I don't think their game plan is going to change. I like Penix a ton in Minnesota's system, working with an offensive-minded coach. Um, And I I just, I really think that molds really, really well because we've seen him do that kind of offense already. Yeah, bringing this into reality for a second um, too, you know, there's a chance that Minnesota just decides to sit with the draft capital they do have and not trade it to go swing at a quarterback. And Penix most likely will be there um, you know, when, when that first pick or may, maybe even that, that second pick that they have in the first round arrives. Um, and not to mention too, great situation for him because look, we don't know, you know, how he would do with less talented receivers because he basically was throwing to three NFL receivers at Washington. What a better situation to put him in that to put, give him one of the best receiving cores in the league. While you were talking, Mark, I just realized something, which is why I had a weird face on my look and or a weird look on my face rather. And I think that I'm going to change who I'm going to pick here. I'll, I'll go through the, the offensive 
um, tackle that I was going to mention, but Roman Wilson has to be a good fit because then they would have Hawkinson, Jefferson, Addison, and Wilson as their receiving core. <laughs> How your mind works. You are when such you were, an idiot. When you were talking, I was just like, wait, no way. You that guys is- see why you, when I speak, this is where John's mind wanders. Like he's thinking about rhyming names and like unbelievable. You can tell you're a musician at heart because you're thinking about writing a song yeah, about the Vikings rather than do, but it's, it's all good. Um, this guy, this then, guy who I actually was going to say too is, uh, is Olu Fashnu. And the reason why is because talk about Penix or rookie, um, you know, quarterback or whatever. And you talk about, you know, some of the pass rushes that are, that are in this league. Um, Fashnu is probably the best, uh, just strictly pass blocking tackle in the league. And for that reason, I do kind of like his pick to, to the Vikings. It's not an immediate need for the Vikings, but at the same time, the Vikings offensive line could use love. They're just, you know, potentially spreading that draft capital to other positions of need, but um, they would 100% benefit from, uh, you know, getting a guy like fashion on the team as well. I think that they could 100% stand to upgrade their offensive line. Um, Moving on to the Green Bay Packers, and Mark, I, th- I think ours are are pretty tit for tat here. But I mean, for me, like Cooper DeGene, I think is one of the first people to come to mind. They're needy for a corner. Um, you know, I I just slash I don't know the, safety say slash safety. Um, I think the Iowa to Green Bay for whatever reason, like just the kind of Midwest, like same brand in my head. Obviously, I know it's not the same state, but they just kind of it kind of feels like you it know, is the same brand. Similar yeah, vibes it's like that. Yeah. It's like that hard nose underdog, um, you know, small town, right? Like not your like Green Bay is right. a small town, dude, and it's but it's very a football tiny. king. Iowa is not a very Central Michigan is a bigger school than Iowa. Did you know that? <laughs> I did not know that. And the other thing too is that Iowa prides themselves on developing their talent in house. I mean, you take a look at you know what they've yeah. done for they know the tight end position in the NFL. Like they they know how to develop people. Green it, Bay, same it, way, man. A, they develop people. Like that's what similar they do. culture, similar culture, and how the coaches work, how the, how the building of the team works. I really like Cooper DeGene, like you said. And if still available, I also like Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo. Uh, Cooper Jean can do more for you in terms of versatility and on the back end, like, do you need him to play safety? Do you need him to play corner? He can play nickel. He can blitz. He can return punts. So he brings more to the table in terms of as a, a whole package. But Mitchell is, I think when it just comes to pure coverage, I think he's a better cover guy. I think he's one of the best cover guys in this draft comes from a smaller school and out of the Mac with Toledo. So that's really the only knock people can have on him. Film checks out measurements check out speed checks out i think he's a steal if he's still there so that's a guy i think that fits really really well as in, you know into that system of hey go follow the second best receiver because you got to remember they have jair alexander so if you can pair somebody else up with that and now you're taking two weapons out of the game i really love that um I, I'm, so I'm I'm changing subjects just a little bit here, but as far because the biggest knock against Mitchell is Mac, right? Didn't see any real talent. Having been a a Mac athlete yourself, Mark, like where do you see the biggest, I guess, like drop offs as far as the general level of talent? I know there obviously is one, but like you know, is it a speed situation? Is it a size situation? Is it a coaching situation? Like. Because he was locking guys down all over the place all season. I feel like that's a skill set that will translate to the next level, regardless of him not doing it at the SEC or the Big Ten. Um, I'll give you two biggest differences as being somebody. I mean, I've played in many MAC games where, you know, we're playing at Bowling Green, Ohio, right? In, in front of, I don't know, maybe 15,000 people. Um, and then I've played in front of crowds like, you know, I played at Miami in the hard rock stadium with, you know, 90,000 people, or uh, I've played at Wisconsin in front of 88,000 people. And I've witnessed the jump around fourth quarter. Like, so the environment is the one biggest difference because I only played in a few games in my career like that, where it's that big of an environment and and the crowd noise is a different factor. The culture around you is, is a different, like it's just a different game day feel and the pressure is different. Um, that's the number one biggest thing. A lot of these Mac guys aren't playing in those big games as consistently as guys that are at bigger power five programs. 
And that's just, that's just, that's just fact. The second biggest thing, 100% is the offensive line size, offensive line, defensive line size, and consistent, like your average offensive lineman at a power five compared to an average offensive lineman at a Mac is drastically different. And the skill set of those guys that you see drastically different. I will say there's plenty of guys that have come out of schools like central or Western Michigan or, you know, Toledo that are, are linemen that do fine, but there's not nearly, you know, like when you look at the percentage, it's not nearly even close. Like it's, that's the big thing in terms of skill quarterback play receiver play defensive back play i mean shit man the mac hangs up there with with any of them i mean you look at some of the best receivers to ever play you know in the nfl a lot of those guys are mac guys right. you know we've had mac receivers get taken in the top five before and do like Corey davis is, is was an, is an all pro several times antonio brown's a mac guy he's one of the best mm-hmm. receivers we've ever seen play the game so um i mean shit randy moss was technically a mac guy at marshall <laughs> i know <laughs> like so I, you can do whatever you want to do, but receiver and skill, not a huge drop off. Offensive line, defensive line, big time drop off in terms of the average. Gotcha. And so, you know, it, it bringing this back to Mitchell as a prospect, like you think his ability to hang with, you know, whoever in the Mac is going to probably translate successfully to the NFL. I do. There's, yeah. there's not a lot and he, of and he, there. Any flash signs of it, you know, he had a really good senior bowl uh, week mm-hmm. where he was going against guys like Roman Wilson and all these top receivers that played at big time schools and he, he held his own, you know? So yeah. I think that that goes to show um, if you can cover, you can cover, man. Like it's, he might not be covering the Marvin Harrison's of the world every week, but when you give him a chance to, he's going to do his best. And he actually did play against Marvin Harrison jr. And he did pretty well against him overall, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So in his limited film against stars, he, he, he did pretty well. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty high on him, but, you know, I think that's just the main knock on him as a prospect is is the talent pool that he was going up against. And then finally, we have our Detroit Lions. And how I personally answered this question was, who are the Dan Campbell guys um, that I think just are going to be gritty, hard-nosed, have a, you know, a story to, you know, why they play football the way that they play football, all of those things, because those are really, we've seen it three years in a row now. Those are the intangible elements that, you know, the Lions tend to look for in their guys. Two come to mind, um, both of which are second round guys, and both of them I think are within the realm of possibility. So potentially be looking at a trade back from the Lions at 29. I think that is possible if the guys that they want, um, you know, are mostly second round guys and the guys that they wanted above them aren't there anymore. So two guys are Xavier Leggett, um, Brad Holmes wants a, you know, large six, four type, you know, jump ball kind of receiver and, uh, Xavier will get lost. Both of his parents going through school, just kind of, you know, like hard nosed gritty really had to work his way to get any playing time and told everybody at the bowl last year, like next year is going to be my year. I'm going to tear it up. Watch me. And, you know, grit mentality. I think he would fit in with Detroit's culture incredibly well. The other one, Zach Frazier, uh, center out of West Virginia, um, the second ranked uh, center uh, under Jackson Powers Johnson. I like him going to Detroit because I don't think uh, Powers Johnson is going to be there. And I also think, again, better culture fit. This dude's a wrestler. Um, Some other notable wrestlers on uh, the Lions are guys like Malcolm Rodriguez. Like they just find ways to get playing time. And Mark, I'm I'm sure you you see this too in, in the kids that you coach, like Wrestlers just have a different mentality about wrestlers are sports. different. They're a different breed of human. Yeah, and it's, it's special. you don't miss on and that. It <laughs> always converts well to football. Like if you're right. if you're a wrestler who also happens to play football, you're a better football player because of that. And there's just no doubts about it. So yeah. all we, and that translates really well for guys like linebackers and and linemen because it's the physicality, it's leverage, all like that stuff is so big, and mm-hmm. and you can't teach any better than having to wrestle somebody. So. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I like uh, I like Cooper DeGene. You know, I know we've mentioned that name before, but I think Cooper DeGene fits this this mold really, really well. It gives you another versatile defensive back where, let's be honest, number one weakness on our team is that position. It's defensive back just as a whole. You yeah. know, we flash signs of good safety play. We flash signs of good nickel play. We flash signs of some good corner play at times, but we have not been consistent across, you know, an entire season at any one of those positions. Cooper DeGene brings in a guy and he can play any of those spots where you need him to, which is what I really like. And I also really like Kool-Aid McKinstry, you know, just a, just a freak athlete that can run with anybody in this division that can run with anybody in the NFC. 
um, a cover guy, like I've said, that can take other teams' number one guys out of the game so that we don't have to worry about average corners trying to guard superstar receivers, you know, and that's just the Lions had that problem all year. We had guys that are average trying to cover superstars, and it's a tall task, and our number one defensive back just wasn't up for that challenge, and it, and it kept teams in games against us when they really shouldn't have been. Um, yeah. and, it, and a lot of the losses that we had, you can look at that being the number one reason we lost games. So Absolutely. you got to address that position for me. Yeah, I no, I agree. So one way or another, I know I didn't mention them in, in mine. And really, I think the problem is, is that I don't know if any of these top corners that we're talking about totally fit the the Lions mold um, of what they look for in a guy. And so but I think the jeans probably the one that fits that the closest. Um, again, maybe Wiggins, but he's he doesn't like, you know, run. Defense. Maybe Mikey. Like, Mikey could be another good fit. So I, I'm hey, still. I would, I would like, I would like Mikey a lot, but we, you know, we have a Brian branch. And so it's like, does it get redundant or does having re two really freaking good nickel corners just in general, make your team better? Which Again, they don't necessarily have to be a nickel. It's such a weird box that they, you know, they put that nickel tag on you and all of a sudden it's like, you can only play nickel. You know, there's no way that we could use you in any other way. It's like, I don't know, man, he's played more than just nickel in his college <laughs> career. Brian Branch played more than just nickel in his college career, thrived at safety spots, did some corner. DeGene did that as well. Uh, Mikey Sarancel did that as well. Like, I don't know who we're kidding, but you draft a guy that's versatile. He can do multiple things for you in the secondary. I'd rather take that than a sure fit cover guy. Because if you draft them and he ends up not being a sure fit cover guy, then what else can he do for you? Useless, Nothing. right? Yeah. <laughs> so not helpful. So that that is essentially our take on the NFC North. Um, let's move to the AFC East because I just think it's an interesting one. There's a lot of teams trying to address a lot of different needs. So I think there's a, a good chunk of conversation we can have. Um, let's start with the Buffalo Bills. Mark? Yeah, it's pretty simple for me. You lose, you, you, you lose digs in, in this trade. Uh, Josh Allen's the best, you know, arguably the best player in football, you know, with the most talent and can do the most for your team. You've got to get him a weapon, you know, you've got to get him a weapon that he can consistently just get the ball to a guy that can get open, you know, no matter what kind of coverage you throw at him, no matter if it's a speedy defensive back, a longer defensive back, who's going to be more physical with you. You need someone who can do it all. I, I really like, um, two guys for them at that receiver spot. Cause I think you got to go receiver. You've got to get a number one receiver for him. I like Adani Mitchell because of everything I just said, his ability to do kind of anything you need a receiver to do. And I really like Keon Coleman. I think if Mitchell's gone, Keon Coleman's a really good fit for them as well. Um, you need a receiver where the quarterback play is going to make that receiver a little bit better, right? It's going to take a end of first round, second round receiver. It's going to make him play like he was a top 10 receiver, uh, top, top 10 draft pick. It's going to make a Keon Coleman or a Donnie Mitchell play more like a Marvin Harrison Jr. That's what you need, and that's what Josh Allen will do. So you don't necessarily have to reach and try to move up and go get one of those guys. I think Josh Allen makes the right receiver a superstar um, if you get him in the right fit. I like those two guys for Buffalo a lot. Yeah, my, my one concern for uh, A.D. Mitchell is just the fact that like he, I, I feel like they shipped Diggs out because of drama, personality, selfishness related issues and that's the tag that keeps getting whether he deserves it or not i've never hung out with the dude personally i couldn't really tell you what his mentality is around getting the ball um but i think that um that could be a cause for concern while keon coleman i think you know i, I definitely lend to to that being a better fit another one potentially troy franklin i feel like he's somebody that nobody's really been talking about a ton and they're like speedy. Wait, wait hold on speedy fast like large wide receiver one with good hands with a lot of experience. Why, why have we not been talking about this guy uh, all draft season? I mean, with how loaded this receiver class is, I think it's bound to uh, some of these guys that are probably going to be steals just yeah. are not going to, you know, they're not going to get drafted super high. You're not going to get talked about a lot because of the fact that this uh, receiver class is so deep. Um, Troy Frank Franklin's one of those guys. And another one, Mark, that, you know, you mentioned Josh Allen makes these guys better. I think he's a, he's a perfect example of uh, a guy that Josh Allen could bring the best out of to play at the NFL level. Um, New York Jets, they have a good chunk of needs. Um, where do you kind of sit as far as fits for, um, you know, either Aaron Rodgers offensively or obviously that solid defense that has been very consistently good over the years? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think that you address the defense early in this draft. I don't think that's the priority. I know they have a defensive minded coach. I, you got to protect Rodgers, man. I know that he got injured and it was a fluke thing, but you know, Aaron Rodgers is going to make or break this team. He's going to make this team a Super Bowl contender if he stays healthy. I just think that that's the truth. Any team he's on, I don't care what's around him. Just so happens they have one of the better defenses in the league to go with what he can do. You got to protect him. And then you can kind of build um, the outsides from wherever you need to, you know. But I think in the draft, you've got to try to address the offensive line. And J.C. Latham is a, is a guy I think will be will be there for uh, their first pick and will probably maybe even be there later on if they want to move back up and come back into the first round and get another guy. But J.C. Latham, I just see being a good fit for them. Um, you know, his athleticism, obviously his size, uh, playing at a high level in the SEC for many years, seeing guys – that can absolutely get after the quarterback. That's what he's going to see in this division. And um, Aaron Rodgers needs somebody that he can trust, somebody that's been in big moments. You know, you don't have time to develop a, a smaller school guy or a guy that's got question marks. This guy's done it at a high level for many years. He's been coached by some of the best coaches in college football. Uh, I, I think you go with the safe pick, J.C. Latham. Yeah, um, I do think protecting Rodgers is a priority. I don't know if signing, you know, to – Older tackles is really the solution to that because if those guys get injured, you're running to the exact same problem. So I do agree that, you know, and a guy like Latham too, a very sure-handed pass protector, um, you know, can definitely get the job done there. Now, on the more fun side of things, uh, receiver, tight end, right? We can have some conversations about that. What is the the like trope with Aaron Rodgers, right? And and his receiving talent. Doesn't like the young receivers very much, right? That's like the big thing is like he he struggles to gel with younger receivers. So there's one guy that I think as a rookie would be successful with Aaron Rodgers as a receiver, and that's Roma Dunze, because he is an NFL vet inside of a a whatever 21, 22 year old's body. Um, and I just think the amount of options you get having him, Wilson. Williams, Conklin, all in the same offense. I mean, that's that's a pretty crazy. John, right you you make a good argument, but does it matter? If Rodgers isn't playing because he got hurt. I agree. Because he can't protect him. You know, it's totally like, agree. Totally. They agree. got weapons, man. And uh, do you? I know how like exciting that can be. Solve both problems with the Brock Bowers, right? Like, does that kind of? Because I mean, he's a receiver that plays. I know tight he's end. a genera- He's a generational talent. I can't believe that Brock Bowers may fall in this draft. And I think that he will just because of needs, right? Tight end, and, positional value. Dude, he's yeah. a generational talent. He's he'll, he'll be the best tight end drafted since Kelsey, you know, like if we're being yeah. honest. I really think that, and I don't think there's many people arguing that. Mm-hmm. It's tough. It's tough because a, a lot of mock drafts have him going to, to, to New York. And I don't know. I would go offensive line. I would go offensive line. I think it's the best fit. I would even move back and take J.C. Latham and maybe get some more capital and then get another receiver later in the first round or second round if you want to. There's talent, dude. There's talent out there. Well, not only that, but, you know, 10's a pretty good spot. Like, you could move back and potentially get an offensive lineman and Brock Bowers out of the situation, you know, solve both of those problems. Now, the problem is you, you need somebody that wants to trade up for a you know, X particular player at 10 for any sort of deal to work yeah. out like that. So obviously we're, we're getting into to the weeds of speculation at this point, but I digress. Next one, Patriots. Um, They have needs all over the place. Really, yeah. there's not a single position offensively that they couldn't, <laughs> you know, uh, stand to maybe try to upgrade somewhere at. So um, take your pick of the litter, but who do you think would be the most successful with the Patriots who are rebuilding, have a new head coach for the first time in over 20 years. Um, we're the worst team in their division and one of the worst teams in the league last year. Like what guy would actually have a positive impact on, you know, the wins and loss of this team, but, you know, most likely to be successful in, in this, you know, pretty shitty situation. And one of the shittier situations you can go to, I'd argue. Yeah. There's, there's, there's two things with new England, right? Uh, new coach and, you know, obviously they're going to be a defense first team. That's just how their franchise is built. That's going to continue with the coach that they chose to hire. He's going to have the same philosophy, the Patriot way. The truth of the matter is this, the downfall of new England was not adapting and, um, you know, 
to the surroundings around the league of what's happening scheme wise, how to build a team like their plan, their program kind of expired. It, 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 it ran its course and other teams adapted. They did not. So you got two things. You can draft a quarterback, right? And if you draft the right franchise quarterback, it kind of solves all your problems. I think Drake May is the best quarterback prospect in this class. I think he'll be there for this pick. And realistically, I do think that that's a legitimate guy that they may take. The second thing is this, right? If you don't go quarterback route, or if you go quarterback and then you want to move back in, another fit that I think absolutely fits them if they're able to be aggressive and do this. When was the last time the Patriots had a true number one receiver on their team Dude. that no matter what quarterback is playing, like I'm, like, I'm talking like Randy Moss had, there's an asterisk right. next to that. Cause that was like a free agency move. And Tom Brady, obviously like, you know, it was a match made in heaven, but it wasn't a long thing like that. That wasn't right. like a, a very long thing. These slot receivers, these underrated guys that Belichick used to find, like that only does so much. And you have to have the right quarterback for those guys to thrive. That's why Edelman, Welker, you know, Chris Hogan, all those guys, Amendola, that's why they had great careers, you know, in New England. It's because they, they thrive with Brady. You need a guy that's going to thrive if I'm throwing the ball or if you're throwing right. the ball. Okay. No, you, need Marvin Harris, you need a Marvin Harrison. Jr. <laughs> that's, that is like, to me, um, obviously anywhere he goes, I think he's going to be a star, but to go to New England and finally have a receiver one and you become attractive for quarterbacks and free agency, if that's the route you choose, you become a, a, a security blanket for a young quarterback. If you do draft a quarterback as well, and you just you have one guy on your offense that you don't have to worry about. That's what right. New England needs. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you because here's the problem with, you know, I think Drake May could be a great fit for the Patriots. And I think most likely at three, they are going to draft a quarterback. But I think that they need help everywhere. And I think drafting your franchise quarterback doesn't do a whole lot if he's throwing to nobody. And you can't protect him, right? Again, the, the argument that we're trying to make here in this episode is where would people be the most successful at? I don't see a reality in which Drake May is super successful with the current infrastructure of the Patriots offense. And I don't think that's a hot take by any stretch of the imagination. Now, right. what you could do, like what Mark said, go and grab a, you know, a number one right, wide receiver or a franchise tackle. Uh, Joe Alt is one guy that you you know it might be early to go grab him, but I mean he's considered one of the safest picks in this draft. You know, have a guy that is just a a rock for your offensive line for a decade to come. Um, I think that could be the better move for the Patriots, and I think they should 100% consider a trade back if they're not fully sold on some of these quarterbacks because you can load up talent and then try to solve the quarterback problem later with good receivers and a good offensive line. Look what that did for, you know, a guy like Jared Goff, who was considered a lost cause when he came to Detroit. And now, yes, he's, again, one of the best offensive lines in the league, loaded with weapons around him, but he's a freaking successful quarterback because of it. And he would not thrive in a place like, you know, I don't know, Washington or Patriots. Or I don't think there's anybody that would thrive in New England right now unless no. they do something else around the quarterback spot. Truly. Yeah. You, and it would be very on brand for the Patriots to trade back to. So that's the other thing. There's plenty of quarterback needy teams that will – Chuck draft capital at him to make that happen. I think the Dolphins. I mean, we're gonna say this name again later on, but I think that having like Xavier Worthy on that team, it just excites me, dude. Having Waddle, Tyreek, and him, and the same receiving core that can line up in motion and shift. I just can't imagine a defense that could handle that. I don't know what you'd have to do in the back end to be able to try to even contain that. And it's just like a touchdown could happen at any moment whether it's a short route, intermediate, or deep ball. Like, it's it, a touchdown fun. could happen because the after the catch is crazy on all three of those guys. Two is pretty accurate down the field. Um, obviously, you got to protect them, so you got to go offensive line at other points in the draft as well. But, oh, man, that would be – I'm just doing that because I think it would be so fun. And Mike McDaniel, if he's sitting there, I don't know how he skips over trying to just – collect all the rings it's just like i was gonna say like just receiving core dude of speed resisting the urge exactly it's it's the most fun um and yes i think he would be wildly successful with the dolphins because um he would be what the the fourth receiving target all that have you know sub four is it the speed. smart thing to do no no <laughs> it's no. not the but smart thing to do and who would be would it be a sick fit yes super sick I think uh, the smart thing to do and who would be instantly successful is a Jackson Powers Johnson. This will be one of maybe three or four times you hear this dude comp to a team. 
it's because he is just an anchor in the center of your offensive line. Um, I, I was listening to some analysts a couple weeks ago. They were talking about like his body shape is just like a square. Like it's almost like he was designed to like just sit in the middle of, of an offensive line and be successful there. Um, they obviously lost some some interior offensive line guys uh, through free agency. And so, um, you know, plug and play. You have a franchise starting center for, again, the next decade. Like I think off- offensive linemen are the least sexy picks, but they make such a massive difference, right? Because as soon as you don't have a good O-line, everything falls apart incredibly quickly. All right, with that, apologies to the Dolphins, but we will move on to the NFC East. Uh, talk about the Commanders, who, for me, I- I'm going to go offensive line here too. It's the same argument as the Patriots to me, where it's like, okay, great. You have this franchise quarterback. Let's say it's you know Jaden Daniels is who- who's comped most often, and yet your offensive line sucks. And so... Um, this is another one where I think pass blocking matters a little bit more than run blocking. I don't know what their identity is going to look like as a team, really. I don't think anybody does. I mean, we know what Kingsbury likes to do, um, and it is a lot of passing. Um, so I like I like Ogu Fashion to this one as well, um, or potentially a Joe Alt as well. I think they both would be, again, just staple. Hey, it's not a sexy pick, but maybe that's the right choice to make right now. Because if your rookie quarterback, if it's a Jaden Daniels, who's a skinnier guy, is getting sacked left and right all season, he's not even going to make it to the end of the season because he's going to be, you know, on IR. So that's my my take on that. Yeah, I mean, I think 100%, without a doubt, the best fit is Caleb Williams. And, you know, the reason why I'm so high on Caleb Williams as a commander, and I have some concern, real concern, with him anywhere else is the chemistry and relationship that he already has with Cliff Kingsbury and the unique offensive structure and relationship call play caller to quarterback that that presents, right? It's that Lincoln Riley Kingsbury, that branch of, of play caller and quarterback relationship. It's unique. It, it dominates college football. I mean, you look at the last few Heisman winners. I mean, it's, they got their fingerprints all over it. And the reason is because it's a unique thing. It doesn't always translate to the NFL. Uh, he had some, he had some early success with, you know, kind of, I was able to utilize Kyler in Arizona. And uh, I just think that Caleb presents a perfect situation for him. And I'll be honest, I, and this is as, as bold as a statement as it gets. Cliff Kingsbury, if he doesn't get Caleb Williams, will fail in this role in Washington, no matter who they get at the quarterback. I don't care who it is. If it's not Caleb Williams, he'll fail. That's and cool. if Caleb Williams doesn't go to the commanders, He'll fail that in is, the grand scheme of the in terms of expectations of what Caleb Williams has. If he's not a commander, he will fail to live up to the expectations that people have. He'll be a middle to pack quarterback. If that, he'll be you know kind of bounced around. He'll he'll be good in moments, but will he ever get the job done? Will he ever be a franchise guy that you you know talk about for years and years to come? I don't think so. I really don't. But if he's with Washington, he teams up with his old buddy. I think there's a shot that he could be a legitimate all-time great, you know, player in this league. I that is that's, that's how good take. of a fit. That is a super bold take. I don't know if I can get on board with that, but you heard it here on the podcast. Michigander, Detroit Lions fan, is not afraid of Caleb Williams and the Bears this coming season here. Um, and look, I, I Based off of how they handled fields, I do not have a lot of confidence in their ability to run an efficient offense with their current coaching regime. I, I'll say that much. Um, so I don't totally disagree with you there. I just feel like Williams is walking into an incredible situation. Um, I mean, you you couldn't be walking into a better situation from a personnel standpoint as he's walking into. But that, that can ebb and flow. So who knows? Um, all right. Next one, the New York football giants. Um, another team that I think really, really, really would benefit from having a true weapon wide receiver, number one, um, you know, and this guy probably will go to the giants, um, assuming that they, you know, don't get the quarterback itch too much in this draft. And that's Malik neighbors. Um, that he, I think the, the Odell Beckham comps, um, have been, you know, all over the place, but they're there and there's a reason for that. Um, there's a lot of similarities and the giants really we, haven't we saw had what it. that did. 
We saw what that did for New York when they had him there. You I was going to say, the Giants haven't had a number one receiver really since Odell Beckham. So let's change yeah. that. Let's let's lock in neighbors, do it as special, make it happen. I actually think, um, you know, I, that's what's most likely to happen. But I actually think Romo Dunze is a better fit to them than neighbors. Um, just based on the situation they currently have a quarterback, you need a guy who, no matter where you put the ball, He's going to come down with it. Malik Neighbors, the one thing that you can knock, you know, when you compare him to Harrison and Odunze is that that neutral ball catching. That's the only thing that those two guys have him beat at, right? Everything else I check to Neighbors, but that neutral ball coming down with it in tight coverage, I give to Odunze and Harrison. And Odunze is probably going to be there. And I don't know how you pass up somebody that can just make every catch, no matter if he's open or not. You know, because let's be honest, it's not like the Giants are going to scheme up some crazy stuff to get their guys open. Daniel yeah. Jones isn't going to – he's not going to throw a perfect ball, right? Some of those routes that Neighbors runs well, like it takes a good quarterback to get him the ball. And Odunze just like doesn't matter. Just like throw me the ball no matter what happens here, and it's a, it's a safe bet. So that is why I kind of like that fit a little more than Neighbors. Obviously, I'm not going to complain if they draft Neighbors or Harrison or anybody. I just like Romo Odunze in this role. A little bit better. Yeah, no, I don't I don't disagree with that at all. It's it's the same like maturity argument where it's like, okay, like, you know, how how well are you gonna step up to the plate right away and, and handle yeah. whatever is tossed at you at the NFL level? All right, how about them cowboys who made basically zero moves in free agency? So um that looks like they're yeah. looking to continue to build the team through the draft, probably because they can't afford to make any free agency moves. Who do you like? I got a couple interesting ones for you, John. And this is this is this is just any time in the draft. But I, you know, we're talking about best fits. Doesn't have to be their first pick, you know. Uh, but Blake Corum, Blake Corum in this Dallas system, right? They want to run the ball first, and they have to have a running identity for them to do what they need to do. And the Cowboys have had a lot of success. You know, has it has it always transcended into the playoffs? No, but they've had a lot of regular season success. And I think the thing they're missing is that engine, that Z, that prime Zeke that they had for a little bit of a window that they, Blake Corum could be that boost, right? That can make the the tough yards. He can do that, right? He can get you the tough yards. He can, he can fight through. He can pass protect for Dak. He can add a layer of security for Dak, and he doesn't have to worry about the pass rush as much. Um, he can do some stuff out of the backfield too if you need him to. So I really like that fit to, uh, to go along with what they already have. And then another guy on the defensive side of the ball, Pair him up with with another Penn State guy, Chop Robinson, right? Put Micah with Chop Robinson opposite of each other. I think Chop Robinson is one of the better defensive players in this draft. I think he's going to fall in this draft. Why? Couldn't tell you. I just don't see him going early across these mock drafts that I'm seeing. Yeah, he might be there. He I think with there. Chop, it's a, it's a lack of he, right. He's just a large, like prototypical, like defensive end. With I think the way other people look at this is that like, it's a lack of, of pass rush moves, lack of technicals. I can think of a better guy to just put on the opposite side of, you know, Parsons, mm -hmm. who's one of the best technicians in the league. Right. And then you have, yeah. you know, uh, we use this to describe Montgomery and Gibbs, but Sonic and knuckles, right? Like you can just yeah. have Chop Robinson crash down bull rush, create pressure. And then Parsons there for cleanup. So, um, yeah, I like Amarius Mims for this. And now Marius Mims is a very concerning prospect but i feel like this is the right time right time to gamble and i think it's realistic that um the cowboys um you know could get him he could fall this far now mims is probably like like from a physical standpoint like how he's built it's like this man was born to play tackle but the sample size is half of a season basically that you have to work with of him playing full games um cowboys know how to develop offensive line talent like crazy. And they're not going to be asking Mims to do too much right away. They can let him develop. They, you know, can be cautious about his injury history. They can just let it happen. I really like Mims to, to Dallas to take up that tackle spot. I, I think he's, um, you know, I could, uh, with the injury history, with the lack of like, you know, on field experience, I couldn't think of a better place for him to go to be successful personally. And, and obviously a need for the Cowboys right now. Um, moving on to the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah. Um, they've, they've done, 
their fair share of may, being aggressive in free agency. And, you know, they continue to somehow uh, tell us that the cap is cap because I don't know how they, I mean, they just extended Devonte Smith too. It's like, I don't know how they continue to do this stuff and get away with it. Um, but they've got some offensive line stuff that they've got, they've got to straighten up. Obviously losing Kelsey as a center is going to be a big piece, but I don't necessarily means that I don't think that means they have to go center, right? I know you're probably going to say Jackson Powers Johnson. I would love that here. That's kind of an obvious fit. I actually really like Tyler Guy Tyler Guyton here uh, out of Oklahoma. Just another added tackle piece, just to try to protect Jalen Hurts. And obviously, I think he's pretty good in the running game as well. And you're going to be a run first team. Uh, that's what Philly has to do to get back to that Super Bowl Philly team we saw. They have to be able to run the ball, and it has to be more than just Jalen Hurts running the ball. And they clearly are trying to do that with their moves, you know, going to get in Saquon and stuff like that. So I'm behind it. Go get an offensive lineman. Go get a tackle. Doesn't necessarily have to be a center to replace Kelsey, um, but you got to continue to strengthen that offensive line because that's what got you there in the first place a few years back. And they're they're close, man. They, everything else's boxes are checked. So yeah. go get that offensive line right. And you're looking at a team that could easily be competing for a Super Bowl. Yeah, I think um, I definitely think you're you're on the right track there, and I, I think he's he's a, a great fit um, as far as you know offensive line goes. Because I have the same here as on the offensive side of the ball. Obviously, I don't really think they have too many needs anywhere else. I like somebody that could potentially flex into guard or tackle, just depending on what the needs are. Um, you know, two like that, that that come to mind are uh, Tulise Fuaga. Um, and Troy Fatanu, uh, both of them can be tackle or guard, right? You're getting either a stud right tackle or a really, really good guard. I, I like uh, uh, Fuaga better because of the fact, as you were saying, Mark, strong need to establish the run. They need to get that run established. They got Saquon. What better than take the the biggest, mauler, angry tackle that you could imagine? Um, and then defensively, um, which Mark, you, you sent me this guy and I, I looked more into him and I actually think this is probably the area that he would be the most successful in. Doesn't have to travel super far from where he's at right now too. Uh, that's cornerbacks, Max Melton, who I think is just, he might, he might not be a CB one, right? But that's the best part about going to Philly is he wouldn't have to be. You're talking, you know, Slay, uh, CJ Gardner, Johnson, Blake and shit. Like they're, they're, secondary is already really, really good. And so I can't think of a better situation for him to develop into, you know, an NFL corner than, than the Eagles. I think that would really, I love, uh, I love my dude, that. such a good prospect in my eyes, you know, another slept on guy. Yeah. I mean, and uh, you know, Mark, I, I'd like for you to probably even speak just on, on his talents a little bit better. Cause another guy that I just feel like is not being talked about at all. Uh, people listening to this might be hearing his name for the first time because, you know, he's a cornerback at Rutgers who doesn't win a lot of football games. But, man, he has all the NFL traits that you potentially need. Yeah. No, the biggest thing for me with him is his skill at the point of breaking up the pass, right? So it, when it comes to coverage and, you know, uh, transitioning your hips and getting in and out of breaks, like he, he, he does all of that well, fine, right? But there's a lot of guys that do those things well. What separates him from what I've seen other people, like what stood out to me about him compared to these other defensive back prospects, at the point of the catch, he's so damn impressive with just being a gnat. Like mm -hmm. he causes problems for receivers, and he never makes it easy to catch a neutral ball. He knows how to get his hand in there at, at the right time, with the right play, with the right angle, um, and he knows how to create pass breakups and knows how to pick the ball off when given the opportunity. And he creates those opportunities very, very well. He can, he'll trap quarterbacks, he'll bait quarterbacks. He's a very savvy, smart guy out there. And that kind of play separates. And he's not afraid to hit either. So he's, he kind of is the full package. And for some reason, he's just not being talked about a lot. Yeah. Hey, and that could, you know, I know we already talked about him. That could benefit a team like the Lions or something like that, too, who I, I really think that if they're not sold on a corner in the first round, they're not going to go for one if, if there's any, you know. Yeah historical precedent to that. Um, all right. Who do we have next year? Sorry. I'm just, I'm just checking out the, the draft board, which it looks like we, the next one we should probably hop into is the AFC North. That's cool with you. Sure. Um, all right. Let's start off with the Cincinnati Bengals who have a bunch of like, not insane needs, but just, you know, like 
I think ones that will make the team a lot better very quickly. Like it's like, Oh, it'd be great to address this issue or that issue for me. Johnny Newton's kind of that guy, right? You obviously lost one of your best interior um, guys to the lions. Um, I can't think of a better replacement than Johnny Newton, who, if you've watched any of Illinois films, like throughout the past couple of years, I mean, he just grabs your attention. Yes. He's undersized, which I think we're talking like a 20 or 30 pound difference of like what you want from a prototypical, you know, nose tackle, three tack, whatever. I don't really care. That dude gets sacks like crazy. Um, he's just incredibly fun to watch. And I think uh, him in a Bengals uni would be sweet. You know, a little diff- different shade of orange, but I think it'll look good in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. That's definitely one of the point of needs. If you go defense um, with Cincinnati, I like Murphy, obviously, as well. I know he's got some off the field concerns, which makes it more likely that he'll be there when they pick. It's a matter of the ethics, moral code. Do you take him? Do you deal with it? Uh, if he's there, you got to consider it. I really like Fursk as well out of um, Florida State. This guy's got – he's just so good with his hands. He reminds me a lot of like how Aaron Donald plays the position. Undersized, you know, he's got like those those short, strong arms, and he's just – he's so good with making sure that you don't get your hands on the inside of his chest plate. He never gives you a clean blocking slate ever. It makes it hard, very hard, to have any movement on him, and he's going to win those one-on-one matchups often. And he can be good in the run and in the pass. Um, if you go offense, which you got to think about, you already have a great offense, right? You lost Mixon, so you got some running back concerns. But you've got Joe Burrow. You've got Jamar Chase. You're going to probably lose T. Higgins at some point, right? Like that's the, that's the major concern. So if you're thinking big picture with this franchise, it's not necessarily like a right now solution. But a guy like Xavier Leggett, like you mentioned, um, the, the, the comparison to him and what T Higgins does for this team, I think he sure. would do very, very well in that same role. And so if T Higgins is a guy that you don't want to have to pay, you can go get maybe a cheaper version of him and see how he does, right? He might be just like T Higgins in that role. And Joe Burrow is one of those guys, again, that's going to make the receivers better. So you don't necessarily need to go be aggressive in free agency. You don't have to overpay for a receiver two when you can go get an, another rookie contract receiver two. So that's my okay. that's my offensive side of it. I dig it. Um, Browns, um, you have a, a receiver that you dogged on quite a bit. Yeah, um, la, you know, last week, change of heart, <laughs> or you just feel like this is the right fit for him? A little bit of both. I mean, I was hard on Lad McConkey in our last episode, and I still, again, I don't see him as a first or second round receiver. Like, have some people have him going just way too high, in my opinion. But if he's there in the times right. I do think he makes sense for this team. Um, they need us. They need a consistent, sure-handed slot receiver that can provide a little bit of speed. Obviously, can do all your intermediate routes. You, you need a third-down guy that you can just like trust. No matter who, whoever's playing quarterback for them, whether it's Watson or somebody else, like you need a third-down receiver that is just like, hey, if I get him the ball, like one, he's going to be open, and two, he'll catch it if if I get him the ball. And you know, Watson had that in, in Houston, and he and he did really well when he had that. He needs that in Cleveland. I think Lam McConkey is a good fit in that scenario. And I, I think he provides a little bit of a um, a character change to, to, that, to their culture, right? There's some culture issues with Deshaun Watson being the lead of your team. Obviously, there's always going to be some kind of floating idea that maybe their team chemistry is not great. And I think McConkey, everybody you know that he's been around and played with has good things to say about him. Um, and he's got a great underdog story. So I think that's a good guy to bring in and and maybe change up a little bit of the the karma, maybe perhaps of of what people look at your team as. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the Browns, I, I don't know where they pick first, but it is nowhere in the first round. So he could still be there for him. Um and keeping that in mind, uh, I like Will Shipley. You know, we we talked about him uh last week. Obviously, Nick Chubb uh had one of the craziest knee injuries I think any of us have ever seen. Um, and then, you know, Hunt's getting a little long in the tooth. He's more of an RB two. Um, let's get some fresh blood in there. Will Shipley, I think, you know, speed size, he kind of has all the measurables for a successful NFL running back, um, behind one of the best offensive lines in the league. I I think they're, you know, right there in the conversation of top one or two offensive lines in the league. Um, I think he'd be very successful and would immediately have a a good role, um, within, uh, that team. So, 
you know, running back, I know it's not one we're, we're mentioning super, super quickly, but uh, you know, Mark, you, you had me thinking about Shipley and why he was so freaking low on some of these draft boards. And like, that could be a great fit for him. Um, Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to do this and I don't think it's a possibility unless they move up, but I think Jackson powers Johnson's a sweet fit for him for, for Baltimore. Um, just again, his versatility, right on the interior, like his ability to to move to that guard slot if you need him to. He just adds depth at that center spot if you need him there. Um, I think that he fits the Baltimore mold of what they're going to try to do. You got to keep in mind what they did in the off season, right? Because a lot of times with teams, and this is a this is just a general synopsis of what we typically see in these drafts. What these teams do in the off season goes hand in hand with their plan in the draft. And sometimes people in the media don't piece those two things together. They went and got Derrick Henry. They have a running quarterback like Lamar Jackson. Let's not try to think or overthink the situation. They're going to try to run the football. So they're going to do something in this draft that's going to help them do that. And I don't think there's many better options than him. If you want to get better as a running game, he's one of the first guys on the list that John or anybody else is going to match him. Yeah, so um, I do think addressing their interior offensive line is a need. Another need that people, I feel like, aren't talking about as much, but there is one, is that edge rusher. How about Darius Robinson, right? Massive, high motor, I think fits that culture really well, kind of a gritty player. He's another guy that I could see going to Detroit as well. Um, I think that's potentially a good defensive fit. And then another thing that people maybe are forgetting a little bit too is I think they're losing Odell Beckham this year, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah, he signed a he one year really much of their he wasn't, their but the there. we saw what having a receiving core, like a truly competent receiving core with more than one competent receivers did for Lamar Jackson's game this last season. I don't think they're gonna want to lose that. Um so another one and, and one that we haven't mentioned, and you know, will probably be a trade up if if you were to go get him. But Brian Thomas, I feel like, you know, opposite Zay Flowers would just be a sick one two punch. Um, but I think Thomas would be instantly successful. I mean, you know, him, Flowers, Andrews, that's a crazy combination. Maybe they don't feel the same kind of pressure because of the fact that they have two really good tight ends. Um, so I don't know there, but just one that popped in my head is like, nobody's saying receivers in need, but I think that's something they're going to try to protect is just how good of a receiving core they had and what that did for Lamar Jackson as a player. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for, uh, definitely uh, both both sides of that would benefit from, you know, having a, a, another kind of number one caliber receiver headed to Baltimore. Last one is the Steelers, which I don't know if you did this on purpose or not, but uh, you have another guy that you think would, would be successful with the Steelers. Yeah. I mean, I'll give, I'll give my DeGene take again. Cause I would, for DeGene, okay. when I was thinking of Cooper DeGene, it was like, okay, Steelers and Packers are like the two, like, I could just see him in those uniforms. I mean, come on, how similar is Pittsburgh's uniform to Iowa's, like the black and gold? <laughs> right. um, and it just, it just would, it would just work, you know. So that's my simple answer. I also had Jackson Powers Johnson here. John screwed me and had back to back, but it is what it is. And um, you know, I just again, I really like this prospect and Steelers mold. Their identity is very similar, I think, to the Ravens. That's why it's one of the best rivalries in the league. Might as well have them have the same best fit guy. Let's see who gets them. Yeah. Um, another guy that potentially um, might be a good fit, TJ Tampa. I mean, they just know how to develop secondary players. And so that was the guy on my list for the Steelers that, you know, is within the realm of possibility for them to grab where they're picking. You know, draft. Tomlin loves a, a DB project, you know. Dude, I mean, it's, it's it worked like out with favorite, Joey Porter right? Jr. last year. Do, do they get hungry and try to go get another one? Do they yeah. Do they try to address that offense? Like, I don't know. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of different routes, but yeah, I mean, you could a, go you know, one thing is, here too. Like, obviously, yeah, so. for sure you could, dude. You, for you sure could you go could, anywhere. But... <laughs> I mean, they're they they have a lot of problems they need to address. But the weird part is, is that they still like they still feel like they're going to be a good competitive team because that's what Tomlin always dude, does. They have so. they have Fields and Russell Wilson. Like that is so that is just like a bizarre combination of talent. But they they could be special if they utilize those guys the right way. And they yeah. might utilize both of them, you know. Yeah. I would. Um, all right, NFC West. Let's hit that one, uh, just because that's that's fun. And uh, Arizona Arizona Cardinals are picking very high. Um, and 
honestly, Mark, we said this, right? We said this over a year ago. We had a Cardinals fan get really mad at us saying that they were going to be just brutally bad. And honestly, I'd say they weren't brutally bad. They were just bad. Um, and now going into this season, they have a ton of draft capital to work with. Their situation isn't as bad as you'd expect it to be. I mean, they have a franchise QB. They have a good offensive line, some holes to plug up on defense. Um, where do you see guys being successful with the Cardinals? Yeah, I mean, it, just because of the the amount of the sheer amount of picks that they have, um, they could be really creative in how they want to do this, right? If I'm them, I probably trade some of those early on picks, trade back, get more value, more cap value. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be hard for them to pass on Marvin Harrison Jr. That's where a lot of people have him going. And I just think about Kyler Murray and his, you know, he doesn't have DeAndre Hopkins anymore. He had like, who is the, who is the guy for him in Arizona right now? They, they don't have one. Right. Right. And for so long, the Cardinals were built around Larry Fitzgerald and just a legendary receiver, one of the best that's ever played the game and ever will play the game. And I think that you got to go and try to address the receiver thing for, for Kyler to even have a chance to compete. You have to. And I, I mean, I, I think he's the, I think he's the I, sure you know, guy they're going to take. And it'll with, be a great fit if that's the case. With him going to Arizona, most likely, the n- number of Larry Fitzgerald comps that I've heard has actually been pretty low. But honestly, like, maybe not so much on their play style, but I think you can make a strong argument for their play style. But even their demeanor, right? Like, Marvin Harrison's a pretty, like, quiet, you know, like, seems yeah. like, g- you know, gentle-natured dude. Like, that was kind of Larry Fitzgerald's brand as well. So I just kind of think that's funny um, that... I don't think a lot of people are really making that comp necessarily, but you know why, like, John? Well, Not to be why? an ass. Everyone's comparing him to his dad, right? <laughs> like I that, know. That's that's the stupid thing, and ob- and obviously he's a lot like his dad as well. Well, but, but yeah, people are also saying I've heard Calvin Johnson, Randy Moss. Yeah, it's and all crazy. That stuff, it's and dumb. Like, it's like, dude, yeah. he's obviously the son of one of the best receivers of all time. You're going to compare him to the guy that has the same name as him, but <laughs> Larry Fitzgerald is a good cop. He's a, he's a very good cop. Like for all the reasons you said. And it's just like it's just funny. I'm just being an ass, but it's, yeah, it is I funny. Know. Like they're, you're you're not getting the cops that um, that normal guys would get because of the name. Right. I still think they need to address edge rusher too, right? And so, in a potential trade back situation, maybe you look for a guy like Dallas Turner. I think could be successful there. Or if you want, you know, a more fun edge rusher, uh, Leatu Latu, right? Because I mean, he's he's the most technically sound edge rusher. Um, fun you know, name. Fun guy. I mean, it's he's just fun to watch as a player. You just wanted like, to say that name. Sure. Um, or the fact that he is an absolute technician off of the edge and is a lot of fun to watch and on passing downs. So technical um, answer or fun answer? Both. Technical technical guy, fun guy. <laughs> All right. The LA Rams, who will have their first first round pick. I think since Sean McVay has been a coach, which is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. Does he get greedy and go offense, which I don't think there's a ton of needs for, frankly, maybe offensive line or talk about being fun. I think Latu is another great fit with the Rams. I mean, you could, could also, be. you know, go Murphy too on the interior. Like those are my two yeah. guys. It's like, you know, okay, you're trying to fill Aaron Donald's shoes or you're just trying to add just in general, a, more of a pass rush. Um, so those are my two guys for the Rams. I didn't really address offense because I frankly would be surprised if they do. But hey, man, Sean McVay deserves his first round pick. He's earned it. <laughs> so, I would be surprised if they go offense as well, just just with what that defense needs, losing Aaron Donald, obviously. I think that's the main concern for them. It's like, okay, how can we even come close to filling that void? Because that's a pretty big void to fill. Yeah. Um, I mentioned him earlier, but first out of Florida State, again, mm-hmm. I, the player comp I have, is Aaron Donald in their style of play? Obviously, you know, he's nowhere near what Aaron Donald is. Nobody, nobody is, but he is a lot like him in how he plays the game. And so I think if you can plug that void with someone like him who at times will flash things like what Aaron Donald used to do for you, that's the closest you're going to get to replacing that guy. So that's that was what I would go with. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, Okay, Seahawks. Um, Seahawks is interesting. Well, so I 
there's two primary needs in my head for the Seahawks and it's interior offensive line and really anywhere on the defensive line, but interior defensive line. So sorry to start bringing up some of the same names that we've already talked about, but I, I think Murphy um, on that defensive line is potentially a, a really good and interesting fit. Um, and then, you know, maybe a guy like Graham Barton uh, for, you know, who can play center, can play guard. You can actually play tackle. You have two, you know, older tackles that have had some injury issues um, over the past couple of years. I think could also potentially be a good fit for the Seahawks. Um, you know, both of what, I mean, really, man, that team is like, not super the NFC West is almost being back to being called the NFC best. I think any four of these teams could, you know, really do something this season. So um I and I feel like the Seahawks are just a couple steps away. Do you think it's worth any reason of them considering quarterback? Um considering the fact that Penix's offensive coordinator is is now you know coaching there. Is that where you're gonna go with this? I assume it's a thought. Okay. It's a thought. I know I had Penix with Minnesota, but he'd obviously – I just – listen, I really like Penix as a prospect. I think he'd do well there. I think McCarthy would do do well in Seattle. If they go the quarterback route, I think that those are the two guys they should have circled. Um, I also like Verse here. I like I like going defensive end, mm-hmm. you know, pass rusher, guy who can really just – he's an X factor for any defense he goes to. I, I think he could thrive in this situation. The Seahawks need to get after the quarterback to compete in this division. They got to get after guys like Stafford or Purdy, get them off their game, get them off their timing. Cause if you let guys like that in those systems, just pick you apart, that's all they're going to do. They're going to pick you apart. So you got to throw something at them that they can't handle, get them off their timing, get them uncomfortable versus one of the best pass rushers in this draft. To me, I, to me, I think he's, the best defensive line prospect in this draft. And if he's there, which some mocks haven't falling there, I think you got to go with him. Yeah. I mean, the the thing is uh, there are four or five really solid edge rushers in this class, but none of the teams that are picking in really even the top 15, other than maybe Atlanta, like really need to have edge rusher circled as a, as a top priority. And so you could see one of these top edge rush talents fall. Um, Last but certainly certainly not least, the San Fran 49ers, who are another team that like have a, a first round pick for the first time in a while after the Trey Lance trade, if I'm remembering correctly, right? Maybe I don't know. They they got one other one in a trade, I think, at some point. Uh Mark, who you got? Um, I like uh Quinion Mitchell. It's the two Mitchells. I like Quinion Mitchell if he if he somehow falls that far, which I really do think there is a chance that he falls that far. Um, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, it's it's just the it's the ability to take somebody out of the game, right? The, the pass rush they have, what do you got to put behind that? Because those things work hand in hand together. Get a lockdown defender; it's going to make Boza and all those guys' life easier, and vice versa. Um, so you go lockdown DB, or or there, it sounds like more and more likely that they might l- lose um, Brandon Ayuk. It doesn't sound like mm. he wants to go, but they're going to have to pay him. Can they afford to? Do you want to pay him? You're already paying a lot of these other guys. You're eventually going to have to pay Brock. So they're already kind of thinking ahead in 49ers way, which is why they've been good for many years in a row is because they're always thinking ahead. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, I think he'll for sure be there. I really think he'll be there. And, and if you want to move up a little bit to be safe, I just think he's a great fit because – any of those character issues that, that you're concerned about, John, in terms of him wanting the ball and all that, you put him in a system like this where it is a true team system, he has no choice but to buy into that because he right. won't succeed if he doesn't in that system. And guys like Debo, um, guys like Brock Purdy, guys like McCaffrey, Kittle, like they're going to force you to buy into that, into that Shanahan system of we're going to share touches and, and some days it's going to be your day, some days it's not, but we're going to win football games. It's hard to bitch when you're winning and they win. So 100%. I really like that fit for them because he's a talented, talented guy. And if that's the one flag people have on him, I don't right. think that's going to be a problem in San Francisco. They've had, right. they've had other cultural issue guys go in there and it's like nothing ever happened. You know what I mean? Right. They just, if, when you're winning, it's not a problem. Yeah. Agreed. Um, for me, I think they need to address safety. I mean, that's one of the bigger problem areas. Um, Tyler yeah. Newbin is, is one. Yeah. I think he's considered like one of the best, like pure safety prospects. Another guy whose name we've thrown out there a insane amount of times at this point, but Cooper DeGene too. I mean, if you, you know, corner ability to flex safety, um, could be solid. 
And then, you know, taking a look at, and maybe, maybe not at the end of the first round, but, you know, they also need to address the guard situation. I think they're, they're very, um, um, they're not deep, whatever. They're very shallow. I don't think that's usually thin. described for it. Yeah. They're thin. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a, a Christian Haynes or a, a Cooper beep um, could be two guys that they could look at, you know, second, third round that would be successful there. Cause they'll probably get starting opportunities basically right away um, because of the fact that that team, you know, they have probably the best tackle in the league, but the rest of the offensive line, man, I mean, we even saw it with the NFC championship game. I mean, they were, they were yeah. able to successfully pressure Purdy quite a bit and that should be a problem area they should look to address, especially given, you know, who their, their competition is in, in division um, and, you know, what they're trying to fortify, which a lot of it is pass rush. Um all right, AFC West, which this is a fun one because, you know, we'll start with a team like the Chargers who have a million needs and a coach that's changing, you know, really the philosophy of the way they play football. And Mark has a smile on his face because he's about to say something cheeky. And I feel like I already know what it's going to be, but. Jim Harbaugh likes running the football. He likes tight ends. He likes offensive linemen. He values the building the team, which is what he's trying to do in LA, build the team from the front to the back, the interior to the outside. Uh, that's how we built Michigan. That's how we built Stanford. That's how we built the 49ers in those heydays in the NFL. It's what he wants to do. So Joe Alt is everybody's top offensive lineman prospect in this draft. You already have a quarterback like Justin Herbert. I could see them taking Joe Alt. I really, really could, and I don't think that Harbaugh would ever, ever even bat an eye about that. Um, the fun one is we're talking best fit. He loves J.J. McCarthy. Absolutely love this kid, and he has never even mumbled a bad word about this dude, and he confidently says he thinks he's the best quarterback in the draft, and he's not wavering on this opinion. He's been saying that when he was his coach. Now that he's not his coach, he's still saying it. Right. And – if they get a chance, you know, I'm not saying they take him with the with an early pick, but if for whatever reason JJ falls in this draft and the Chargers feel like they can climb back up there and get it, I, I could see him doing it, you know. And what if, like, you know, uh, let's just stick in this crazy fantasy that is not going to happen, which is JJ McCarthy replacing Justin Herbert? Like, could they trade basically a king's ransom away for Justin Herbert? Like, is that kind I, of you the, would the have idea? you would have to be so confident in JJ to do so that. but stupidly confident, which but do you, Jim Harbaugh might be. <laughs> is he is he not? You know, is he not that confident? So that that's some of the crazy stuff I'm thinking. Um, Absolutely insane stuff. Like like if we're being real here, like there's no yeah. Way. I, <laughs> so that's why I have it here. I, you know, obviously it's something people are going to talk about just because of their, you know, their background together at right. Ann Arbor. But dude, think about the, think about what you could get for Justin Herbert right now. Yeah. Um, I like to Fuaga, by the way, uh, as far as offensive line goes, just because he's the best running, uh, you know, uh, tackle. Yeah. What you could get for Justin Herbert though. I mean, that could be, Minnesota trading those two first round picks for him right then and there. And then you still have five and you could just freaking, you know, have your way all the way down the board in the first round. It'd be insane. Um, a receiver prospect that I kind of um, like for them um, is probably Ricky Pearsall, just because of the sure handedness. I think he'd be really successful with, you know, a guy like Herbert. Uh, throwing just absolute darts, yeah. um, you know, again, because they need a receiver, dude, they need a they, receiver, they need too. a receiver bad. And thankfully this is the draft where you can go second, third round and probably, you know, look yeah. for receivers. That maybe, maybe, they, maybe they go out. get Roman Wilson. <laughs> right. I, okay. We should, we should just for fun, which by the way, you still owe an ACT that I just need to hold you accountable for sooner than later here, because like, what the hell Mark, it's been a year and a half. Gotta, gotta busy, pay your debt. busy man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to pay your debts, man. It's been in the banner for a while. We've just been ignoring. I've I've let it slide for a few weeks, but I'm getting tired of it. You you owe me. Um, but we should make a bet of if if and how many Michigan players are getting drafted by the Chargers <laughs> or uh, UFAs too is another potential one. 
I mean, I I honestly think he only drafts one guy, maybe. Who I is? don't think he drafts. I don't know who it's going to be. I mean, right. it could be any of them. There's a there's a deep amount of Michigan guys that are draftable, and no matter what the team is, obviously Harbaugh's going to have bias. <laughs> you add in the Ravens draft picks. How many how many Michigan guys do Harbaugh brothers draft combined? Yeah. Because now we're talking, because I think Baltimore could easily draft a few of these guys. Totally. Um, yeah. And there's a lot sure. of Michigan connect. There's a lot of Michigan connections on the Baltimore staff, too. Right. Um, who's next? Casey. Um, uh, this is a fun one, but I also think would be a great fit. Um, actually, Mark, Mark has, has another fun one that would probably be a great fit. So I'll let you go first, Mark. Um. Yeah, it's it's Xavier Worthy because same reasons we talked about with Miami, but you know, except especially with what's happening with Rasheed Rice, um, you know, you look at a player closest to like a Tyreek Hill comparison, obviously just because of the flat out speed and ability to put fear in a defense, ability to attack down the field. You have a quarterback who can throw the ball downfield as good as anybody we've ever seen. He doesn't really get to do that as much anymore because ever since the absence of Tyreek, it's everybody's just playing this two man coverage against him and not letting him have the cheap, easy ones. And so he's having a dink and duck his way all the way up the field and then make something happen in the red zone. I miss the explosive plays in Kansas city. I miss those big, long touchdowns. They're so and fun. What, dude, <laughs> I, I miss that. And I really, and I really think that Andy Reid wants to be able to have a toy that he can do that with again. And Xavier worthy is that toy. He's, he's that factor that you can bring in. That's going to make everything else underneath easier and it's also, if you dare play him one-on-one, -on -one, a super favorable matchup for Mahomes, who, again, like I said, he throws that ball better than anybody. So give him a guy that can go do that. Yeah, for, for me, similar concept, but slightly different way of getting there. Uh, Jalen Polk, who I think, you know, the guy that's not getting talked about because he's in the shadow of Roma Dunze, very sure-handed, fast, big receiver um, that uh, Mahomes, and, you know, for, like a legitimate vertical threat. Um yeah. You know, so underrated, I, I think, dude, so underrated because of Odunze. Yeah, him and, mean, Mc, him and McMillan, too, him but. and McMillan don't get talked about because right. Odunze is getting stealing the show. But those and McMillan's guys look, you know, getting like a third round, you know, uh, look too, probably. Yeah. So, I mean, Washington truly had an NFL receiving core, um, right there. So, all right, Raiders, uh, who have a whole lot of problems to address, and once again, a, a changing of the guard, um. Pierce is, is a pretty defensive minded guy. And so for me, I think like most likely to be successful. I mean, there's, there's really two ways you can look at this edge rusher or cornerback. Uh, one guy that we haven't mentioned really at all um, is the number one corner, which is Terry and Arnold. Um, I, I think he could 100% be successful um, with the Raiders because one, their secondary is already not bad. Two, I think it's a good fit. And three, I think it's a realistic fit just based off of where the Raiders are picking. Could also look to address edge though. Um, and, you know, take your pick of the litter. Uh, probably best fit though, I'd say, you know, would probably be like a, a Jared verse um, opposite of Max Crosby. I think would be. The only reason I say no to edge is just because of Max Crosby and because already they've there. already invested in interior D line as well with, with Wilkins. And so, you know, um, I really do actually like that. I'm going to actually kind of switch my direction here. I, I like the Terry and Arnold uh, pick that you said, you know, obviously it's a guy that most people have him up at the top of the board. You and I are not as high on him just in terms of how much we've talked about him, how much credit we've given him, but the guy's a stud, man. He's a stud. And if you want to go safe early on in the draft, um, especially at a position like that, where you really can't afford to miss, like, I think back to like when the Lions drafted Jeff Okuda third overall, like what a miss that was and how much that, that set us back, you know, because if a we would have hit yeah. that, if we would have made that pick correctly, like we would have gotten the right guy. If you're going to draft a defensive back, especially a corner that high, you better be damn sure that he's going to be your guy for a long time. I'm talking Jalen Ramsey, Deion so, Sanders, so sure. you know, yep. like you better be really sure. So that's the risk of it. But I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a ton of risk surrounding Arnold. I, I don't. I think he's, I think he's a sure bet safe pick. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a really good fit for them. Yeah. And then last one for this division. And then I think we, we have what two divisions left still, um, turned out to be a long episode. All good though. Um, the Broncos who are in a precarious situation because they don't really, they have a lot of needs. 
Uh, clearly, they're kind of hitting a reset button with Sean Payton at the helm. Um, they need a quarterback that, you know, they got rid of their, uh, you know, I guess number one wide receiver. And though actually I'd, I'd make an argument that Sutton's probably better. What are they going to do at pick 12? And where are people like what kind of needs can they fill where people are going to be successful with them right away? Because they really don't have time to waste. They can't afford to develop guys. They need Sean, Sean Payton's. He wants to win now, dude, and he kind of has to win now. The pressure's That's on what him. I'm saying, you know, but I, they don't this, have a second round sound, draft pick. Like, yeah, <laughs> this might sound crazy, man, but um, and the reason I'm going to say this is not necessarily just because I like this prospect. I like, I really like Spencer Rattler for this fit because of his arm talent, because of his ability to throw um, with multiple different arm angles. Um, you know, slightly undersized, but he's mobile enough to protect himself and make plays down the field. Sean Payton is a, is a quarterback whisperer. He can make any one of these prospects a true NFL threat. Uh, a lot of people are saying Penix or Bo Nix. Um, I'm not as high on Bo Nix as some of these other as some of these other guys are. I'm, so, I'm not either, but I do think that there's merit to just getting like the guy with the most experience to play under Sean Payton and not be. Actually- Rattler's got Rattler's got some experience too. Don't you forget, you know. Um, and he's got a he's got an interesting story from college and playing at two different schools, getting beaten out by Caleb Williams, who's obviously going to be the number one pick in this draft and he's going to have a chip on his shoulder. And I think that he just lines up well with what Denver's going to try to do. Yeah. And then, so I'm, I'm taking the realistic fit route here too. They again, have a crazy number of areas that they need to beef up. Um, but a Malik Washington out of Virginia, who is just a, he's very undersized. He's like five, eight, but he's stocky and crazy athletic. Um, you know, maybe another, you know, you, he, you already kind of loves have, those guys. Uh, not only that, but you already kind of have like the, the size receiver in Sutton. I mean, what he's like six, four, six, five, yeah. he's freaking huge. So, okay. You know, get a little guy to, to go with that. Who's stocky and fast and gritty, um, you know, could solve some problems. And again, I mean, this is a, a third, fourth round. I mean, what consensus I'm looking at one twenty two. So, yeah. Late third, early fourth. Like he's going to be there for the Broncos if they want him. Uh, just just one receiver prospect that I think could be, you know, legit. Another one, too, we mentioned him before, Roman Wilson. I mean, you you know, you could potentially follow the third, could also be a good fit for for a Sean Payton style offense. So um, you know, I, I don't know how to describe what Sean Payton's offensive philosophy is, other than just like you get like a group of weird gadget players together and then they all just start, you know, doing random shit that no one expects and it somehow turns into points. So uh, you saw it not work as soon as he left the Saints. Speaking of, good segue into the NFC South, um, where the Saints are, are incredibly needy. And Mark, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your pick here, a guy that I have not considered to the Saints, but I kind of love it, even though it would be, horrible based off of what their current needs are i kind of love it and so i'd like for you to describe why you think the new orleans saints and brock bowers might get along pretty well together best player um given the value maybe in the draft and the saints having a ton of needs but i think that you you know when you look at the saints and the position they're in they, they can't afford to make a mistake here because if they do it's going to be house cleaned right? The pressure is on, like you're talking new coach, you're talking new G like if they mess up, it's going to be a shit show for them. So if I'm them, I draft like the safest thing I can find. And I think the safest thing in this draft is Brock Bowers. Yeah. Brock I like Bowers, that. Well, it, and also you think about the receiving core that they have now, obviously moving on from Michael Thomas, but you know, you have a good receiving core outside of that. I mean, Michael Thomas has been a non-factor for three and a half, four years now. Um, you add Bowers into that mix, and he does have you know blocking ability and things like that, and he's a freaking insane generational receiver. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, and I think just imagining him in Saints colors is is pretty sweet. Um, the guy that I have comped is the guy who everybody kind of has comped to the Saints because I mean we talk about safety and also just addressing need is is Troy Fotanu, um, who can play tackle, he can play guard, could probably play center. They have needs on the offensive line. That is their biggest problem area by a huge margin. They need to fix it right freaking away. Um, and so that's that's my comp would be 
instantly successful just because of the fact that they they need offensive line talent bad. Um, all right, who do you want to grab next here? Uh, Carolina, because they don't have a first sure. round pick, so it makes it for an, for an interesting discussion. Sure, uh, you mentioned him earlier. You kind of you kind of stole my prospect, Will Shipley. <laughs> I did Will Shipley, him. you know, listen, uh, Carolina needs somebody to relieve some pressure with Bryce Young, a safe security blanket, a um, a good hot route check down guy, like a guy that can make a little something happen after the catch on those plays. And someone that can also pass protect and just, you know, he can do everything you need a running back to do, provides that versatility. You can get them later in the draft. Carolina is going to have to be very, very careful and wise in how they use their picks because they don't have a lot of early ones. So I, that's why I think it's a good fit for them. You can get them, you, you can get them for a cheaper price than I think he's worth. And so when you can do that, it makes sense for a team like this. Yeah. Um, another one you could look at here. This is potentially a good lad McConkey fit because lad knows how to get open for the most part. And, uh, they need receivers that can do that incredibly bad. Um, I mean, it was such a shit show, but the other problem with that, and, and we've mentioned this before though, is offensive line is rough, man. Now who could they go and grab? <sighs> Who's going to be there? You know, that's my question, right? And so you can go. You, I think more than anything, you have to go interior offensive line because all of your tackles are going to be gone. So you, if you're looking for a plug and play, you need a starter as soon as possible. You're going to have to go interior, and then you know who? I mean, maybe Christian Mahogany out of Boston College. Um, you know, very high uh, relative athletic score, six foot four. I mean you know, has, has the build of a, of a successful um, interior offensive line at the NFL level. And then, you know, maybe again, like some of the guys that I mentioned, I forgot who I was comping them to, but Christian Haynes and, and Cooper beep or other ones that are, that are. Who's the guy, who's them. the guy out of Michigan, John, that got hurt. Zach Zinter. Yeah. What about him? I, I like, I like Zinter going there too. And I mean, Zinter's, you know, a, a potentially fifth round pick because of the injury issue, I think is the main problem. Cause I, I think his, I don't know. I personally think he has the makings of an NFL guard. Like, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, talk about areas where he might be successful. I could see him going to to Harbaugh. Talk about Michigan guys getting drafted. Uh, really, either Harbaugh could could use Zach Center's talents at the NFL. Carolina level. could use him. Hell, yeah. Or Carolina could use them. Um, all right, Bucks. They're kind of weird, man. Uh, they obviously had a more successful season than I think they were even expecting, uh, winning the division, going to the playoffs, all that good stuff. But they still, you know, were a barely 500 team. They have, you know, they they lost uh, uh, Davis. I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, you could go corner. You could go defensive line. You could go receiver with your aging receiving room. Could go offensive line. Um you know, it's it's a nice spot to be in because you can address a number of problem areas. But I'm not sure who who do you think uh, would be instantly successful with the Bucks. Um, I really like. I had Terry and Arnold here as well, but I don't I don't really necessarily think he gets there. I also um, I really like Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia. Uh, this is a this is a guy I think he's getting slept on as well. It's a guy we haven't talked about a lot, John. But uh, this is a physical aggressive corner that can play a lot like Terry and Arnold plays, you're going to get him. Um, there's a much more safe chance that he'll be available when you're picking. And you could probably even get him with a one of your later picks as well. This is, I don't know why this guy's not being talked about more plays on one of the best, you know, defenses in the country. He's a part of this Georgia um, defensive culture that Kirby Smart's putting together every single year. These guys are producing an NFL right away. Like these guys are NFL ready. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's happening at Georgia with what they've got going on there. Um, I really like this prospect. I think he fits in what Tampa's needs are and what they're trying to do defensively extremely well. Um, yeah, the corner prospect that I thought could be instantly a good fit, um, that, that I'm going to butcher his name, I'm terrified. And it's Rakestraw, I think is how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Missouri, though, um, six feet tall. I mean, good length. Um, pretty versatile um, and very disciplined. And so I think he could fit well in that defense. Last but not least, the Falcons, who I think in general are just in need of defensive talent more than anything else. I think they they have their, their weird offensive draft picks. None of them are necessarily bad, just underutilized. I think they need to go defense. Um, Dallas Turner, I think, is like the safest pick. I actually yeah, don't think he's the I best. Have... 
Yeah, he's Aaron not the Gallister best edge rusher, well. in my opinion. I, I agree. Think Jared, I Jared agree. Burst or Latu really, I think, are better edge rushers than Turner. But I think if you're just trying to be like, all right, let's improve our defensive line with an edge rusher that we feel good about, I think Turner's the guy. And I think yeah, he'll be successful I, I agree. I, I agree 100%. Cool. Last but not least, we have the AFC South. Um, who picks the highest out of the AFC South? Is it the Colts? No, it's the Titans. Duh. Um, Titans, this one's easy because it's who they're going to pick it, uh, so long as he falls to them, and it's Joe Alt. They they need tackles, and Joe Alt is one of those guys um, that is, again, kind of seen as a reliable, s- safe, generational tackle. Um, I-, I think he's he's the guy there. No debate there, and I think he will fall there unless Harbaugh takes him. Yeah. Never know. <laughs> um. Do you have anybody else you want to toss your hat in the ring for the Titans here? No, just Joe, Joe Alt. Alt. I mean, I Joe think Alt. it's Joe Alt. Like, they, why, right. even, why even joke around? Yeah. Don't even mess around. All right. Uh, Colts. I don't – they need to – receiver or corner are the two areas that they need to address. Who would be most successful out of those? I don't, I don't know who you have for the Colts. I like Brian Thomas to the Colts. I like okay. Keon Coleman to the Colts. Um. It's it's tough for me because they, they the Anthony Richardson thing, you know, it's like they're all in on him, you know, and it's like they don't have an option. Uh, they have to be. <laughs> I know that's what I just I hate it because it just doesn't make me feel good like about them, and I I just wouldn't be sitting there feeling like okay, we have our guy for the next six to ten years. I just don't think that they have that going on, and they're betting on that. Man, God, I would love yeah. them to take a quarterback, but they're not going to do that. So, yeah, I guess I'll give them my two receiver prospects that I like that maybe can help Anthony Richardson become their guy. But, you know, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, this is another guy I'd, I'd mock Arnold to, um, you know, or another team I'd mock Arnold to, rather. How about Bo um, Nix to the Colts late down the road, like later in the draft? Uh, it's, it's, I don't like it either, but it's over. We're dealing with what we're dealing with over there. So You don't think um, they take him late, you know, just like the – or how about Sam Hartman late, like late, late, just to just to bring in somebody that's got he's got more experience playing than Anthony Richardson, dude. Six year guy, bring him in, dude. Oh, it's over. He I'm looks just like Gardner Minshew. I mean, Gardner Minshew ended up beating him out for the starting spot last year. Anyway, might as well just do it again. He didn't. It was freaking got yeah, injured. He, he did though. He earned like once he started playing, they were clearly better with Minshew. <laughs> no, one hundred percent. It's it's not they a- were better with Minshew before they ever just like they just decided to start him because they want so desperately to be right and they're not. Yeah, it's it's really rough, honestly, all around. Um Jags uh, two really three main areas, right? I think offensive line, receiver, and then you know if you if you want to add some some corner help too, I think that's a, a route they could go. Um, this is another, and I think this is the third time I've mocked. I'm saying it's a good fit, but I do think it's it's a really fun fit. Honestly, Xavier Worthy, Trevor like Trevor Lawrence just needs a freaking weapon, like just just somebody that actually breaks the game a little bit for him. Um, look, he has not panned out to be the NFL quarterback that I think people were hoping to thus far. I still think that potential is within him, and I just think that like. This kind of is a prove it year in that sense, obviously, right? Heading into is this year year four for him? Um, so obviously, you know, coming up on potentially, you know, that fifth year option, contract talks, all that stuff. Um, he's been just a, a below average quarterback, and I think people were hoping for more. And maybe investing in the receiving talent helps kind of unlock some of that potential. Yeah, I got a different receiver, another guy that we haven't talked about enough, uh, Jermaine Burton. Jermaine Burton, um, this is a guy who was at Alabama and Georgia and is over the course of his college career and had great careers at both. Um, I think he's freaky athletic, man. And I think that he provided a lot for both those programs while he was there. Dominated ball in the SEC. And I just think that he never really reached his full potential in college. But I think you're going to see him continue to grow and develop. And I think you get him in the situation with a guy like Trevor Lawrence getting the ball. Sure-handed guy who's going to get open, runs routes. Like I think he can kind of fill that Kelvin Ridley role, that void that, that you're going to have. Um, I really think he could do a good thing there. Yeah. 
Um, not familiar with his game whatsoever, so I appreciate yeah, the bio. I'll I'll, uh, I'll get you educated on it because he's cool. a good prospect. For sure. Yeah, um, I'm I'm pretty proud. Of, I mean, because you know, Mark and I do not do this full time like a lot of draft analysts do. So the fact that I think we are kind of like 50, 60 players deep at this point and kind of have a good familiarity grasp of you know not only who they are, what they do, where they're from, but also like certain attributes and nuances to their game. Um, I'll, I'll take two seconds to pat Mark and I on the back for that. Cause again, you watched we watched a lot of ball, John. Yeah, uh-huh. we, we do. We and it's purely from, from a fan standpoint, cause no one's paying us for this shit. Um, the, the last team to cover here, and then we'll do some quick new and noteworthy in the news section, which will be very fast. Cause there's not a whole lot that happened. Um, are the Texans and the Texans do not have a first round draft pick. They forfeited that first round draft pick to go get Will Anderson last year. That worked out well for him. But they have some areas they need to address. They're looking good on offense. I, I don't think they really have too much they need to do there. So probably defense. And a guy that just, like, I I love this fit. I think instant success. I think D'Amico Ryans is going to love him. Apparently the NFL at large is raving about this player. Um, so we'll see if he goes earlier, if the Texans can even grab him. It's the CEO, Mike Sainstrill, um, coming out of Michigan. Um, again, Mark saying, you know, getting, getting upset over it, but it's, it's fair. Um, the whole like nickel corner comp, uh, he's a cornerback. He can, he can play cornerback, but him at that nickel position for the Texans. I mean, that's just crazy potential there. Like, I, I think it could be disgusting. So it's a dream, that, it's a dream for what D'Amico does scheme wise too. I, I think it's a perfect fit match made in heaven. If they're able to, if they're able to get him. I, I think he'll probably go off the board earlier than people are projecting him to. Yeah. Um, anybody from you? Uh, I like him. I like uh, Colson, another Michigan guy. Right, you're going to see the Michigan bias here. But I, again, D'Amico, they need they need another linebacker as well. I think this guy's a dog. I think he had a great career in college. Um, you know, he's not afraid of anything, and he's a, he's a guy that will go and he'll be a run stopper. And D'Amico's going to want to stop the run. Um, I think he's got a bad taste in his mouth after not being able to to stop the Ravens as as well as he'd like. So that's something he's probably going to want to go fix because he's a defensive guy first. So mm-hmm. uh, either one of those guys, though, both Michigan men, I don't think you can go wrong with either either one of those guys. Yeah, I, I I think the Texans really get Mark and I jacked up in general. I mean, which I think a lot of people have the same feeling on it. It's just like, man, like they, they rebuilt overnight and they went from being a shit show to a wagon, like a legitimate They're a good, they're a good team, brother. They're a good team, brother, I just got to say. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're um, going to be a threat we're going to talk about a couple news events here this first one isn't really a news event is it just is a fun discussion point what the hell was the 2017 rb draft class on i think we're going to look back at this draft class and look at the receivers that are still uh productive in the nfl and kind of have a similar like like i mean you got lombardi lenny christian mccaffrey Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, Kareem Hunt, James Conner, Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones, and Austin Eckler. I mean, that's Dude. crazy. For yeah. one, dra- like I didn't realize this until this this graphic popped up per PFF. Like that's insane. How about and again, the Packers? How about the Packers having two of the guys? Dude, the Packers signed like three tight ends last season too. Like what? They're so weird. Um, but honestly, I think the double dipping strategy kind of works if you can afford it. Uh, the Lions double did a down, couple dude. times in their rebuilding. Yeah, it's like, hey, we like that guy too. Let's see what happens. Um, so yeah, again, I think we'll look at this receiving draft class and kind of have a similar opinion of like, wow, that many guys came from 2024. Um, next year, uh, this is purely Lions Detroit news. Uh, the Detroit sign does light up. I did not know that. Um, so hey, hot take, hot take. I don't think it's so bad. It it's disappointing when you saw what the mocks were supposed to be, but I think in yeah, a vacuum, I think the angles bad. matter, right? Like the totally. angle you drive it. Like when have you driven past it yet? I haven't. Obviously, I'm in Texas now, but no, I haven't. I haven't seen it in person, but I've seen some really bad pictures of it. Like, but I've also seen people drive by it and take videos, and it. I don't think it's as bad as people are making it out to be. It's disappointing because it's like, dude, can can we not do something right, like ever, you know? But it, it well, I do. I think it looks better at nighttime when it's lit up. It does not look as good during the day. And again, it's all about angles. It's like 
it's like anybody, dude. Everyone's got good angles, bad angles. I could find a million pictures of John where he's not going to look good, and I could find a million pictures of John where he does look good. It's like, dude, it's who is the photographer here? You know what I mean? Are they trying yeah. to make you look well, good, or are they trying to make you look bad? D- Detroit rapper G Mac uh, released a diss track of the sign, and we'd like to have yeah. him on the show as a result of that diss track. So just just putting that out there um, right now. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it looks as bad. Um, just probably disappointing and hey uh as far as like city architecture goes in the state of michigan we fumbled the bag a lot of times not just in detroit but um for those that don't know uh what would it be north what west north northeast of detroit there's a place called sterling heights and sterling heights just made like this giant golden ring in the middle of of uh one of the worst highways on earth that always has traffic on it and the locals have deemed it the golden butthole. So at least this isn't a golden butthole. Uh, hey, at least at least we got the Palace of Auburn Hills right. That lasted us a long time. Dude, I can't believe that I grew up from such an iconic venue and now it's just a parking lot. So Dude. brutal. So brutal. So many memories there. Last thing, uh, the Jets are the first team to reveal their new uniforms with a new logo, which is an old logo, but it's a new logo. Um, I love, 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 love bringing dude. back old logos. And also, love like, it. these... these Love like, it. I, I know the collars are controversial. I disagree. I think the collars look great, like, the, the contrast of the color. I think the black unis look sick. My one complaint on this is you did a stripe, but why doesn't it match the shoulder pads? That is my one singular complaint, is why don't you do a three-tone stripe uh, on right. the pants? But... Right. But other than that, I, I'd give this a nine out of ten from the Jets. I, I think this is a yeah, great. Yeah, I, I like it. I now, like it. Not drastically different from what we've seen, but it's enough difference to notice it. And the logo, dude, the logo sells it to me. I love the logo. The logo's it, everything, man. It looks so good. It looks so so good. Um, the Lions dropped theirs probably around the time that this episode is going to air. Um, and I am so stoked I'm for that. Nervous. I'm nervous, dude. They, cause I, God, they're going to screw it up. No, dude. I want, screw it up, I want huh? the, I want the night modernized version of the nineties. That's all. If you give me that, I will be so happy. Like that's dude, all gonna I need. Screw it up. They're going to screw it up. They're going to make it look so futuristic. Negative? You are so going to make it look futuristic. Dude. No, they're not. I know it. No, I know it. That's, that's not, that's literally not what the president said about it. He said that they are respecting the past with a trust modern them. twist. If, if they come out and they're like, like modernized nineties, like everybody wants, are you? Yeah, I love like, it. Okay. Just making That's sure what I want. I want the wrong. same thing as you. I just don't believe I'm going to get what I want. I like to set the bar low, you know, and then be pleasantly thrilled. That's, that's really kind of been your, your whole mantra with the lions. So yeah. And you got to take a standardized really high. Test. You set the bar really high and then you get heartbroken time and time again until last year is the one time in your life you weren't heartbroken and we still got heartbroken by the way we did but you know that's that's what the sports built on is heartbreak by the way Mm -hmm. um the red wings missed the playoffs by uh somebody else winning a game uh they they did what they needed to do scoring and winning should have never been left should have never been left to that though john yeah they did fumble the bag but um this feels a lot like the speaking of optimism this feels a lot like the the nine and eight lion season from two years ago. And um, hopefully they stay hungry going into the next season. Hopefully hockey Tan is back. Trust, so, trust in Iserman, man. Trust him. Iser plan, baby. Um, mm-hmm. All right. That's all we got. Hey man, long episode hour and 43 minutes. We'll see if we want to chunk this one into, into different segments and post it throughout the week or just rip the bandaid off altogether. We'll, we'll talk about that offline. If you've listened through all of, either the entire episode or all of the chunks. We appreciate your attention and we'll see you guys next week for finally the NFL draft draft, baby in Detroit, Michigan. We'll see you guys then. Peace. See you guys.